This is Mrs. Palmer Quay with the first video for Module 7. In this video I want to do a quick review of the subatomic particles in the atom and go on to talk more about the properties of light. We have been talking about the atom and the subatomic particles that make up each atom in several of the previous videos, so I just want to go over again some of these key points. Remember that an atom is the smallest particle of an element that retains all of the properties, both chemical and physical, of that element. That the electron, which is that tiny, tiny particle that travels out in space far away from the nucleus, and it has a negative charge. The proton and the neutrons are found in the nucleus. The proton has a positive charge and the neutron has no charge. And the protons and the neutrons are about the same size, much, much larger, about 2,000 times larger than the electron. So it's the number of protons and neutrons in an atom that give it its mass. We typically draw the atom in this atomic model as we see here with the nucleus in the center and then the electrons out in layers, energy levels, and we'll talk more about those when we continue on with our periodic table discussion, but the electrons are found in these energy levels out from the nucleus. Remember that each element has a unique number of protons and it is the protons that we are counting in the atomic number the smaller number that is found on the blocks on the periodic table. Also remember that an element can have various numbers of neutrons in it and those create the different isotopes for any one element. When I was talking about isotopes previously, I mentioned that carbon being a, a, an example, we have carbon-12 as the most common version of carbon, but there also is a carbon-13 and a carbon-14, which is radioactive and is used in dating, or radioactive dating. So these are all isotopes of carbon. If you add together your protons and your neutrons, you get the atomic mass, which is normally measured in AMUs if we're just talking about the uh, mass of the protons and the neutrons. But then when we're doing mole conversions, we change that to a molar mass and take the number in grams as representing the mass of one mole of that particular element. Remember that the neutral atom is when you have equal numbers of protons and electrons of positive and negative charge, but whenever you have an unequal number of protons or electrons because you have lost or gained an electron, then you have an ion, and the word ion refers to both positively and negatively charged particles. So going on to light. You might be asking yourself, you know, what does light have to do with an atom? We have already talked about the fact that light is energy when we were talking about energy. And the way light connects to our discussion of atomic structure comes from these further facts, that atoms can absorb energy and give off light as a result. And neon signs, of which I have an example over here, giving uh, some light in the symbol of neon, N-E. But neon signs are a perfect example of how electrical energy traveling through a tube of gas, neon gas, will energize those atoms, or particularly the electrons, and end up with the elements giving off a light. Scientists have also discovered that atoms give off specific wavelengths of light depending upon which element it is, is being energized. And so it just because something is hot and glowing does not mean that it's giving off all the wavelengths of light, but there are very specific wavelengths that are particular to an element. We'll talk a lot more about that as we move on in this discussion. This is really just the introductory video. So this light emission, this giving off of light, has really helped scientists understand electrons and how electrons are arranged around the atom. So I want to spend the rest of this video just talking about light. What is light? Well, from a scientist's standpoint, light is electromagnetic radiation. And electromagnetic radiation is a particular type of energy that exhibits wave-like behavior. It acts like a wave as it travels through space. A wave has a particular wavelength. 
it has a certain frequency, and it moves at a particular speed. And we can determine all three of these things about light or about electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation also has particle-like behavior. There are packages of energy that electromagnetic radiation comes in, and we call those photons. And scientists can uh, categorize these wavelengths and particle-like behavior as part of the dual nature of light. So we say that light has a dual nature. And exactly how that all fits together, we're still working on the details. Because it is kind of hard to think about something being a wave and a particle at the same time, but light is able to do this. Electromagnetic radiation is caused by accelerating charged particles, either electrons or protons. And they, electromagnetic radiation can be natural. The sun is the primary source of electromagnetic radiation. But of course, as you see the different types of EM radiation, you'll recognize that much of it is man-made. Much of what we are exposed to is man-made. So this diagram is showing the different types of electromagnetic radiation, the full spectrum of EM waves, and it goes from radio waves at one end to gamma rays, which are another type of wavelength, at the other. And so the radio waves are large wavelengths. They're very long wavelengths, um, as long as perhaps a wave going over Mount Everest completely. Um, on the far scale, and they go down to, on the, the gamma side, very, very small wavelengths, just as big as an atomic nucleus. And so these different types of waves, radio waves, in here we have microwaves, even though it's not listed, infrared waves that give us heat. The visible light spectrum is just this tiny little piece here in the middle. Ultraviolet rays, of course, which cause sunburn, X-rays, which are so helpful in medical um, diagnoses, and then gamma rays coming from radioactive decay. All of these waves are part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and they are all being given off by our sun. Thankfully, the Earth's magnetic field helps prevent some of this material or some of this energy from getting to us on Earth, um, but much of it is present. The, some of these waves pass right through us, like radio waves, not only the ones given off by the sun, but the ones given off by our radio stations, are traveling right through the air. Any place you can tune in a radio, there are radio waves passing by, but they just slide right through our bodies without causing any damage. Of course, we don't want to be exposed to a whole lot of X-rays or gamma rays, because those are a lot more dangerous. Light has certain key properties that we will be dealing with in this module, the first of which is speed. Light travels at a rate of 300 million meters per second, or to put that in scientific notation, it's 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And this speed is the same no matter a, whether it is a um, radio wave or a gamma ray, that all light travels at the same speed in the vacuum of space. Light does change speed as it moves through certain substances here on Earth, but again, all types of light and all types of electromagnetic radiation have the same speed. But they have different wavelengths. So wavelength will differ between different lights and frequency along with wavelength. Wavelength is illustrated by this diagram on the bottom. Wave a light wave can be depicted as this transverse or sine curve wave going up and down. And in talking about the waves, we talk about the wavelength as being the distance between two points that are occurring in the same place on the pattern. So here we can measure a wavelength from the top of the wave that's known as the crest. We could also measure a wavelength across the bottom here that's known as the trough. If you dry, draw a dotted line right down the middle of this model of the wave and measure the distance from that line to the, the crest or uh, conversely to the trough, that gives you a measure of the amplitude. When it comes to light, the amplitude gives you an indication of how intense the light is. Bright light has a higher amplitude than dim light. 
but the wavelength determines what kind of light it is. Wavelength and frequency go hand in hand because frequency is a time measurement. It's as if you were sitting here and your eye, we'll make a little eyeball here, is looking at the tr crests of the wave as they pass by and counting how many times this little point at the crest is seen in a particular amount of time. And so that will give you your frequency. Frequency is expressed as hertz, the cycles per second. The hertz are used not only for light, but we also use them for sound. Sound waves will also have speed and wavelength and frequency, but sound is different from light in that sound is not transmitted through space the way light is. It needs to have a medium to pass the wave energy along. The relationship between these three properties, speed, wavelength, and frequency, can be seen in this equation that the speed, c, will be equal to the wavelength times the frequency, how long the wavelength is times how frequently that wavelength is passing a certain point in time. And so um, if you have to figure out any one of these three properties given the other two, you would just use this formula that speed is equal to wavelength times the frequency. The electromagnetic spectrum then includes invisible as well as visible light, even though what we tend to think about with light is the visible light. And so the visible light spectrum is just this tiny little piece, and it has it covers your colors, of course, of course, from the reds, uh, Roy G. Biv, if you have ever seen that, to think about the order red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet, so they usually like abbreviate it like it's someone's name, Roy G. Biv. And the measurement of wavelength in the visible light spectrum is in nanometers, which is a 10 to the negative 9 meters, a billionth of a meter. The red side of your visible light spectrum have your longer wavelength at 700 nanometers or so, whereas the blue side has the shorter wavelength. You can also see over here with this illustration that the short wavelength tends to go along with high frequency because, of course, if you are standing at one point and watching a wave go by, if something has a short wavelength, you're going to see a lot more of those waves in any particular time period than if you were looking at something that had a longer wavelength. There would just be not that many waves passing. So you can think of these two values as moving in opposite directions. As frequency goes up, wavelength goes down, or as frequency goes down, wavelength goes up. One more comment about frequency and energy. The, there's a direct relationship between the amount of energy that is absorbed or emitted by an object and its frequency, so that high energy electromagnetic radiation also has a high frequency, and as we just saw on the previous slide, it would have a small wa um, wavelength, a short wavelength, and low energy electromagnetic radiation has a low frequency and a long wavelength. The formula we use for determining energy is the energy times what is known as Planck's constant, which is 6.63 times 10 to the 34th joules per hertz, and then that times the frequency. So that the this is uh, where the experimental data came to show that electromagnetic radiation comes in these packets or quanta. It only comes in certain size pieces because of the relationship between energy and frequency being multiplied by a constant every single time. So just to kind of summarize, here we have our entire electromagnetic spectrum. It's in reverse order from the other page. So we have gamma rays down here, the very short wavelength, high energy, high frequency. And so you can see we've got our increasing frequent or increasing wavelength arrow going this way, longer wavelengths on the right, but we have high frequency on the left and high energy on the left. 
also at about the point of ultraviolet radiation, so about this point onward, these rays are known as ionizing radiation and um, I can't spell and talk at the same time, ionizing, because they will create ions in living things, and that is why they are so dangerous to our cells, why we get damage from sunburn, or we, why we are sunburned, why our skin is damaged, or why x-rays can cause um, cancer, and, and gamma rays, of course, can can kill you, just break down the tissues inside you, because they create ions from chemicals in your body that are not supposed to be ions. These radiation levels over this, this type of radiation on the right, the frequency and the energy and the wavelength are ones that do not cause ions to form. They do not steal electrons from the chemicals inside your body, and so they are much safer around for you to be around, and which, as I said, is a good thing because a lot of these radio waves are passing through us all the time. So the next time you're outside walking on a sunny day, remember that the light that is coming from the sun is a lot more than just the light you see, that we have a large electromagnetic spectrum, wavelengths of light that range from long, slow radio waves to short, intense, and dangerous gamma rays, and, any, and a whole bunch in between. This finishes what I want to say on this first video for Module 7.